Welcome. This is a November 14th Beehive Production user call. We have Andrew, Alexander, Hans, Jan, Matthias, John, and myself, Michael. I have an image of Rob N with his swag from the Open ZFS event. The swag has arrived in Australia and China and hopefully Toronto. And uh, yes, apologies. Apparently, there has been a week or two of incorrect uh, time event uh, call times out there. I believe in the Discord channel, and it sounds like Alexander may investigate in that. Uh, we will not introduce Alexander, but um, I will say prolific docs contributor, prolific docs contributor. And it sounds like, Alexander, there is a need for a new generation or wave or something of docs leadership insofar as perhaps folks like Benedict, the go-to docs person who's probably burnt out at this point, might be taking a little break. Um, <clears throat> do you have any way to contextualize that for people? Yeah, so technical writing and programming are different disciplines that are both require skill and care and careful engineering of thinking about all the corner cases of how it's going to affect all the different stakeholders and those two things together you know the doc doesn't matter if the code sucks and the code doesn't matter if no one can read it so um i've been running bsd since i was 12 years old uh i'm still youngish um there's i've got plenty of energy and um don't intend to go anywhere cool um could you at least drop in chat uh, an address or something where I can find you? Um, I not I don't know if I have any contact information for you. So yeah, I, I will get you in the announcements and welcome, welcome, welcome. So Matthias, you had something before we jump into another topic. Do, 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 do. Oh, Doc, okay. Do, do, do what you got. Uh, <clears throat> So I, I, I had go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll read it as you're explaining it. I have this stuff that I uh, I committed to to posting uh, under the form of documentation um, that we that we went over um, last week uh, for Wi-Fi Box, which is beautiful uh, and a lot of. A lot more stuff that I've been collecting uh, uh, over uh, the last few years, but uh, also a lot during the last few months of uh, more actively participating in the in the community calls, uh, which are uh, an incredible source of uh, of uh, knowledge that, of course, needs to be documented so that it uh, yeah, everybody else this uh, can enjoy it uh, and the usual question right uh, um what tool uh, should i use to to do this and to your point uh that you've been um, gently uh, um under underlining uh, a few times right uh, uh, <laughs> doc write docs don't blog um so i understand that the the first target uh there would be the uh, FreeBSD uh, uh, wiki, um, and I'm a bit. I, I I'm both very thankful for the wiki because it has. I have found uh, over the years uh, information there that uh, has been extremely valuable. But it's also a, a place where uh, a lot of the stuff is out of date, and it, sometimes it bites you because you don't realize it's uh, it's out of date. And um, it's it lends itself a lot to casual note taking, I, I would say, which is great in the sense that it's better not to have. I mean, it's better to have a, a, a stream of thought uh, documentation that no documentation. And I'm not saying that everything in in there is stream of thought, right? But it's it's really great for. You know, you, you take notes and uh, you go adding things, and uh, uh, sometimes you don't come back and uh, put them all back together in a crisper. I think that's great, but 
would there be is there a, a something in between the the official collection of do, of document documentation and that more uh, uh, loose uh, um, wiki uh, um, FreeBSD wiki maybe some some uh, guidelines on how to to write uh, uh, good documentation there uh, could be uh, could be useful uh, but maybe it's it's something else and also one point I didn't mention is that uh, one of the things that uh, I find I found sometimes uh, a little bit uh, frustrating is that sometimes information goes to the wiki and doesn't make it to the to the uh, to the handbook uh, or one of the handbooks and um, and that's a pity so, that's where this phrase came up years ago where good documentation goes to die <laughs> it's sardonic but sometimes accurate yeah absolutely absolutely so uh, i was wondering whether uh, uh, since we can we can uh, um, clone and uh, build uh, all the, the the FreeBSD docs. Uh, I mean, it's pretty trivial, right? You you just clone the the repo and uh, uh, install the necessary uh, the necessary um, uh, tooling, uh, uh, which is basically one package. And uh, I mean, one top package, and the rest are dependencies. Um, do you guys? Think that it would make sense to use that as a as a, as a template and maybe publish use it to 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 publish and then it would be both visually uh, visually pleasing multi multi uh, multi format because it you can you know you can build it in to to HTML and to single single HTML multi HTML PDF etc. Uh, and then it would also be easy to to for it to go to the to the to the main documentation uh, where uh, where necessary. Alexander, any thoughts? And welcome, Daniel. So I would like to offer that um, I think the 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 biggest problem that we have really in documentation that's an engineering problem is documentation proliferation. So for me, I have not seen really anything that's compelling that couldn't go in the manual if it was written in a slightly different style. I'm a big proponent of examples in manual pages. And so I'm on the, the triage team. If you file a bug, for example, in FreeBSD, and you say this thing is undocumented, that might not be enough, but if you put um, basically anything you would put in the wiki, I go all the time on the wiki. I've never written anything on the wiki. I will never write anything on the wiki. But if you put that kind of content, many times I've looked in the wiki, found some stuff, and it actually works, and then I refactor the information and put it in the manual page. So I think that really there's no useful doc that cannot, is unsuitable for the manual. It just, the way that it needs to be structured is different. And the thing with the manual is that we can actually build all of those targets. We can build PDFs out of the manual. We can oh, build websites out of the manual. We can, um, if if you're using a desktop environment like Genome or KDE, those have a help application that is seamlessly reads stuff out of the manual. It it does all the hyperlinking, all that kind of stuff, renders it in the GUI. Uh, so uh, also the manual really? is is marked up semantically. So in the future, as we get future even types of documentation viewing, it will be very easy to just extend the Mandoc compiler to be able to output those formats as we've done before. So with the manual being always distributed with the software and owned by the software, uh, I think that it, it can solve all of these problems. And then additionally, if the document descriptions are written thoughtfully, then 
it's very easy to search locally through your manual. Um, and that's, I think, like the minimum amount of energy consumption and processing power uh, that would be necessary for, for finding documentation. It's immediate. It works even in an air-gapped network. Um, so I'm, I'm really very passionate about the manual page. And some of these other targets, like the handbook, um, and, and even more so blogs or, or, or the wiki, I don't see how they're maintainable. I think that it's not that no one wants to maintain it and wants to update it. It's like an engineering problem that it's not maintainable. A uh, quick question there, given the traditional barriers to entry to modifying the base of FreeBSD, and things have definitely improved with, say, pull requests, but uh, how have you suggested people get over that hurdle of perhaps writing up documentation that sits and dies in a review rather than on a wiki or elsewhere? <clears throat> um, so fortunately, the bug tracker is controlled by uh, people who believe in stability. So um, me and a few other people on the bug tracker very strongly object to feedback timeout as a valid reason for closing bugs, right? Okay. Just the other day, I went and found a 14-year-old patch that was misfiled to the manual um, on uh, the Intel 500 series uh, Ethernet drivers. And we refactored that, cleaned it up, and it's in main now. So nice. if you, there are only 336 open bugs on the manual uh, as of last night. If you file a bug there and there is enough documentation that I can do something about it, I will do something about it. Additionally, it creates a threaded conversation that is easy to for other people to add to and is not you know i think it's like much less likely to just die on a review uh if you get it in there i'm interested in doing something about it and if there's not enough information other people can add to that more easily whereas in a review um if it's not kind of ready then for someone else to take it and refactor it is kind of stealing your work. So there's uh, there's additional problems uh, with that. If anybody wants to learn how to write manual pages on mandoc.bsd.lv, there's an excellent tutorial. Um, and if not, like I said, if if you put it on the bug tracker under manual pages, at the very least, if someone else closes it, I will see it. If it's if there's anything actionable in there, I will reopen it. I think that there's no good documentation that cannot go into the manual. People say, oh, this could never go in the manual. And it's like the manual is the operating manual. If it's documentation on how to operate it, then it can go in the manual. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yes, I'm laughing. That's my domain, BSDLV, and that's Kristaps' work. He's here in Portland, too. And yes, I'm glad you found that useful. <laughs> Mandoc has made its way into Mac OS. I'm surprised it's not in Windows in some way. So. Are you sure they're not using that as part of their open SSHD port? Uh, <laughs> open SSHD, but I'm bum. I yeah, you, it's a subsystem to Windows. You can just in, add component. Uh, Actually, that's a good and... point. Does it have documentation? It might. That would be uh, a good I don't know set of complete. Uh, okay, off topic, but included. awesome. Uh, so yes, uh, I won't. Uh, people can easily find that. I've got it loaded on another window, but uh, I'm sure you've all loaded that by now. Um, other thoughts from the John D's of the world and consumers like Daniel on documentation of where, oh, before I forget, uh, I believe Entrene got permission to use any and all FreeBSD journal material for documentation. So if you need that in writing, great, but there's some very good things in there, Alexander, that you can 
uh, borrow, repurpose, I guess, give credit, you know, kind of BSD style. However, uh, that is a source of you know, highly refined and refactored content as opposed to notes thrown on the wiki. Okay, uh, so others who either have a user's perspective um, or yes. good you know, successes or pains, etc. Go ahead, Jan. I have a question because um, almost universally, uh, main pages are reference documentation and not teaching or, or tutorial style documentation. And how would you do it uh, in all of that in main pages uh, and get people to look at it and make them discoverable? Or is, are you just proposing to use the same markup as we use for main pages and make them primarily discoverable through some kind of web site? So my thoughts for this are section seven is the miscellaneous information manual. And mm -hmm. you can see one of them that I've done already, Excuse a me. quick start guide to connecting to basic types of networks for users. I managed to get that into section seven. If I can get a tutorial like that into section seven, then I think I can get other types of tutorials into section seven in a less verbose way. What was the tutorial example you gave? It's uh, networking seven. Okay. And it's uh, it's it's a little bare, but it's a it's a tutorial on connecting from a user standpoint, just getting yourself off the ground, connecting to basic types of networks. Um, um, yeah. Okay, you're already referencing BSD config. Interesting. Uh, so this is John. Yeah, um, please. I, I'm the old gray beard here, I think. And I I love man pages. I think they're great. I I grew up on IBM principles of operation manuals. Um and apologies to any younger generation in this meeting. I deal with a number of folks who expect to find the answer via a Google search. Um on TikTok. Well, take your pick. Okay. Um, That's why I asked how he intends to make it available. Sure, and and every you know sometimes that Google search will come back into a man page, but a lot of times it just it points off elsewhere where the information is minimally out of date, if not sometimes just wrong, um, and. I, how do I phrase this? Sometimes with FreeBSD, there's also, I mean, there's also a difference between current and stable, and you have to take that into account. And there's both. Um, and I just sent a little uh, thing to the chat. Um, I, I've been dealing with FreeBSD for for decades, and I've I still got bitten by the the VFS ZFS Arc Max setting. Um, so, you know, it's supposed to be settable via sys control, but it does not work correctly at boot time unless you set it via loader. Um, and I can't, I mean, and I may be blind, I can't find that anywhere. I had to go sleuth through the code to finally figure it out. But having figured it out, systems are stable. And some documentation says you can put in like 16G and no, you need it in like pages, you have to calculate and other things, which is a <laughs> loader.conf will accept it in human form oh it will oh goodness okay this it humanizes not this this hmm. control affects it via blocks hmm. Hmm. or that so that that's a perfect example of something that's like very actionable for me to work on so we have a sysctl and it is only stable if it's set as a loader tunable, if I'm understanding correctly, then that's something that is very easy. I can send a patch for that today. Um, uh, as far as, you know, getting search engine optimization of, you know, the internet search providers to, to point to our manuals, that's, uh, that's one of the many things that I'm hoping to get more ideas about as I mature. And I am not stating that I know the answer. I was simply 
stating that this is a this is something that I see. And uh, again, I if you know younger people grow up, they have a different perspective on how to uh, gather and manipulate information. Um, I, I still like paper books. What can I say? I like paper books too. Um, <laughs> as for the as for the uh, issue between the difference between stable and current, I think that the manual interface really provides the best possible thing for that because there's a little menu that that, that you can select running stable or current in there and uh the guy who maintains that subsystem hopefully he's one of the people i can get to mentor me over the next 10 years uh because if i understood more about how that worked i'm sure it would be possible to adjust that so that instead of having to be manually generated it's actually drawing out of current current as built on freefall uh because currently the current section on man.freebsc.org is built every six months or something and that there's got to be a way with the modern ci to, to get that running all the time so that that could fix that and there's also a prettier interface uh that that they're developing on man hyphen dev dot freebsd dot org oh. i don't know what's going on with that but i would love for that to make it in the tree i was not aware of that would yeah. what, would love more information about it i'll i'll post a link in the chat it's it's really beautiful so far it seems that openbsd is using the same underlying back end that that we're trying to switch to and netbsd is using it um and it renders really nicely on mobile and it renders really nicely in a console browser like Linux. oh that's nice and lee wen has had some students who've presented some pretty nifty tools at the dev summits in tokyo about new you know, what if you have a visual editor that can actually push out a pull request to fix some docs so you don't have all the barriers of like, wait, get commands. I just want to fix a typo. Well, hold on. Let's add some new new barriers through that. Um, May look pretty, cool. but the new interface um, yes. is stuck at 14 current. That's correct. It's just that's why it's man dev and is not actually yeah. running. They're manually they're manually building those uh, man pages and putting them in there. And I'm hoping that one of the things we'll get and I've been asking to join the working group every month for the last seven months. Um, I'm hoping that one of the things that we're going to get in there is the ability to keep the current continuously pulling those manuals out of continuous integration instead of out of just um, being manually built whenever someone who's already overworked manages to have some time for it. Then level, maybe we want to talk to because he has already done that for ports. Uh, Who? Part of fresh ports. Oh, Dan Langell. Continuously basically pull in the uh, Git repository and uh, extract metadata uh, as needed and update the database. Yeah, that that would be wonderful. That's I think that that's that would solve it's a lot of the problems that we're having. seen on the hmm. JITs and uh, ZFS calls, so maybe. Yeah, I dropped in yesterday. <laughs> so there's that. Out. Um, and the code is uh, of varying um, modernity, let's say, because this has like 25 years of commit history uh, <laughs> yep. to fresh ports. So uh, it's like, why doesn't it use thing? Because it wasn't invented when I needed it. Uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, this is all a fantastic segue to a, a broad hackathon topic that I'm advocating for. However, I do want to knock out any beehive topics while we're at it. Uh, 
Daniel, any fun news on, I don't know, 9PFS and Windows guests and all the things? No, I haven't been messing with too much these days. Everything works, so oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to make any messes. Um, cool. Um, as I understand it, Hans, you're looking for opportunities. Can you characterize that? Well, well, I'm a contractor working on Enumos mostly and uh, sometimes on Beehive. And uh, well, I'm looking for contracts. I'm looking for projects, little projects to do that can help me pay the bills. <laughs> Understood. And um, so just, just recently I've done this, uh, what was it, the software TPM backend? Yes. For, which uh, Corvin has kindly reviewed and integrated. Oh, is that committed? Yes, even Ooh, into a C4 It was a backport. Um, and I even got an email from someone who's using it with Windows, so I suppose it's working. Um, yeah. Oh, fantastic. And, yeah. And, uh, right now I'm doing some, some work on Illumos. Um, trying to get a NetBSD block list you working on the Lumos and uh, there's other stuff that's going on. Have Anyways, you done any that's... ZFS work? Uh, I haven't worked in ZFS yet, but if that is, if, if there's something that needs to be done, I can certainly take a look at it. Okay. Uh, that was very much a topic yesterday. We didn't record it. It was very a, a kind of post-mortem call after the, after the summit. But uh, there's a lot going on, and an open question is what what can the rather virtual Open ZFS Foundation do that is um, uh, of equal benefit to all participants? Uh, they've very intentionally only focused on things like hosting and domains and the summit and not development because there's so many companies doing their thing and they've kept that fully separate. However, there are many great examples from, say, uh, FreeBSD Foundation having contracts to work on specific things, some of which are open. If you happen to be an open JDK developer, there's an opportunity there. But anyway, uh, that is a topic that is uh, very active and hot and it a perfect segue to the next topic, but I will drop in John's notes here. Thank you for that. It's it's all true because I really, really should know that you could put the that the loader, which is not always within reach for what I do, but still, uh, there's that Max RK. And of course, the collision of the ZFS arc and Beehive guest memory is the sort of oldest rite of passage in the book. And that really needs to be documented. So, um, for those who had the stamina Tuesday to hear me go through this rather lengthy list I've been building for years with your help on these calls and parallel efforts, I have a ridiculously long set of topics that have come up. And like topics we brought up as a group at the at the Open ZFS User and Developer Summit, these are often highly refined and thought out rather than knee-jerk reactions to things. So I put the link in the chat for you to per peruse this on your own. But to stay on topic here, I've prefixed them. I've not sorted them, but I've been prefixing them. And there are things like doc colon. So let's see, uh, in-base uh, bug butt reporting. No, bug reporting. So Alexander, to your point, the official documentation on how to file a bug is good, but not great. And I believe it really should be in base absolutely to your point. Um, if you are a perhaps user going from CentOS to FreeBSD and you sell widgets and use FreeBSD to move your widgets or whatever, or Lumos, it should not be a mystery how to report a typo. And um, I think that that cannot be too clear. And it's been an, uh, 
unfortunate that people somehow through lack of documentation or cultural awareness or whatever previous OS they used, uh, people are still putting in the occasional bug report that says it's broken and that's not going to get much traction. Thank you very much. So my soapbox item there is that um, it's a bit like a a review or a bug report are a bit like a conference talk proposal. You have to show your work. You have to justify what you're doing, explain it, convince people. And the more clear it is, the more effective they can be. And on these calls in public, you will see uh, Santiago's struggles with the AMD IOMU that had a beehive little shim as opposed to a proper one, giving him trouble. The, the bug report got a crowdsourced discussion of what the title should be, and it got improved. And the foundation has just recently wrapped up some work to fix that. And it was it was a rather major project, and it started with a, a, a PR problem report. So this stuff is important. Um, Go ahead, Jan. OpenPSD has a command in base called sandbox. Yes, it does. I, a, a, a very um, good point. Maybe we should... Um look into getting a similar command maybe with the same name uh, or report back or something mm -hmm. uh, or something which uh, is easily shortened to pr or something <laughs> um so that we can have a nice little command which also it would be nice if it had an option for users to um, gather reports things like dmisc uh, PCI conf, uh, ACPI tables. Um, and if we want to get really fancy, uh, it would be nice if it had a way to maybe record which bugs you reported from the system and then follow them uh, as, at least as text messages. Yeah, like I, you could I even write something so that you can put it in your that. I'm gonna put it in the profile right or, and prompt, and then similar to mails, get a notification. Maybe have a cron job check every day if your box are done, and if so, write to the user. I don't know, wall or something. <laughs> yeah, well, um, Alexander, thoughts? It's have you seen other precedences like that? Well, I think open BSD sent back just as a mail generator so if you can't okay. send mail from your uh um yeah from your open bsd mail demon then you're out of luck but hey we have a bug reporter which is not purely email driven yeah. so it has an HTTPS api start with bug seven. Oh, there you go um yeah i've already linked to the open bsd <laughs> that would be amazing that that would absolutely be amazing. I am not even close to having that kind of skill set to produce that kind of thing. Even just a proof of concept of banging it out on a on a napkin to inspire people is half the battle. So, so no, don't don't put yourself down there. Bug seven. Cool. Just saying. Just saying. We have libfetch in base. We have OpenSSL. Yeah, we've got a lot of plumbing there. And note things like the TrueNAS. Uh, uh, what do they call it? A, a debug, which is a tar archive of tons of logging, and it, they're mm -hmm. saying if you if you are filing a bug, there's a 99% chance you want to include that, or else it might not, yes. not even get acknowledged but without it, just because it's so important. Go ahead. It's fine for an appliance like this, like um, Trunas Core used to be. Uh, do that. It's a different thing for a general purpose operating system to um, no question, automatically but it's also include potentially sensitive goal. logs in messages and so Correct. So you have to get consent, otherwise people will claim that you tricked them into revealing their whatever information. Um, it's just that we cannot afford to raise any goodwill here by accidentally i don't know maybe someone just the last messages file contains plain text api tokens yes. or something by basic accident. hygiene is and very important i'll i'll support you on that so uh, yeah mm -hmm. what, but and yes things have to be often anonymized and don't just upload your password file and your ssh keys which people do to get etc so a million issues there but yes let's not not which discourage is why this. it would be so nice if, if 
it was fancy enough to tell you that there was a reply or to uh, I don't know store your uh, bug report to our account yep. and then you could see it and it could help you uh, basically send a follow up. So if someone asks for DMS, you can just, okay, here's my DMS. Here's my var one dmsboot or something. Okay, all, all good yeah. ideas. Love mm, it. There is a tool that, uh, that does something like that. That's used for um, the, oh crap, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the tool. Describe it. One of us will probably remember. We're old. We've got all kinds the, of knowledge here. Yeah. So uh, the the original project is for uh, Linux, but it's been uh, also activated for BSD, where you can down uh, install a package and it will let you send uh, a collection of uh, uh, logs and um, output of commands that describes all the TCI, the D message, uh, uh, all the stuff that uh, uh, shows compatibility of the diff. I mean, what you have in terms of hardware. Uh, so, what is BSD hardware or something like that? Uh, I'm trying to remember the. And it's great because you can also use it to find, uh, uh, to see what is supported or not for each. Uh, um, laptop and of course I'm thinking laptop uh, because that's where we have the biggest compatibility problems but it's not limited to that uh, and you can see what other people uh, have etc I mean it's and it has this collection of uh, this uh, this tool that collects that data and I need to check but I think they were doing something about anonymizing uh, some of some of that does that ring a bell for anyone? And I will I will uh, find that in no time in any oh, case. Cool. No, hey, and th they're even vaguely related was, I think, what, BSD stats, which was simply a call home, hey, show that you're using uh, exactly. a non-Linux system. And from a recent call, there was a data center who records all systems as Linux systems or even Windows systems. So it's like, do you run Linux? No. Do you have any Linux VMs? No. Do you have any FreeBSD ones? No. We have all Windows. Well, just because we report them as Windows. Well, that's not helpful. So that there's a fine line between, yeah, exposing secret information or getting meaningful stats that can help justify, say, investing at your data, data center in certain OSs. Andrew Hedinger, you're a data center tech. Uh, I trust you have various OSs. Uh, how do you communicate internally who's running what? And can people depenguinate and you know you sell them a Linux VM and they end up with an Lumos VM, et cetera? Unless um, I'm all. sorry, I've, I've I've got something sorry else talking to, to me. No worries. Uh, same question for Alexander, because you, you said you're a data center tech. Um, have you seen that problem that systems are miscategorized because on a, from a billing perspective, they're one OS and from a mechanical perspective, they're a different OS. Uh, no, at Google, we don't have this problem because they separate uh, administration from technician. So, you know, if the machine is causing errors above a certain threshold, it will be kicked out and a ticket will be sent to us and we will go and diagnose it. Got it. Anyway, so uh, I, I'll it's, put that uh, in the context of that whole call home thing. Go ahead, Matthias. No, just, just uh, the, the hardware probe. I pasted the, oh, the, cool. the name of the package uh, and you can, and it's, you go and that's part of the picture it's not you know it, it that is an aspect of bug reporting and stats and 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 so let's keep it coming love it yeah uh, and th there's a website i mean if you I, i'm pretty sure everybody knows about this one but if you don't it's beautiful uh, yeah and i gosh i haven't 
heard that talk whole topic come up in years. So thank you. That is awesome. Um, and of course, then there's like the nice bug D message archive, which also it paints part of the picture because it's important. Here we go. Probe your computer. Yeah. Cool. 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 If you if you look at, for instance, find computer, uh, on top top right. Yeah. Uh, you can you can look for by by uh, by uh, vendor model and you oh, can see hello. how everything is supported or not on FreeBSD uh, depending on the so it tells you the version of the of FreeBSD that the machine is running and uh, if you click on one it's really uh, it's really um, do you know who's behind format. this that is very cool. So it's yeah. If uh, well, in this case, this is this one is uh, is uh, uh, open BSD. But even if sure. if you click on any anyone and look at the the parts, that is, and now click on the on the ID. Uh, yeah. Yeah, down on the left, and scroll down. Yep, 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 let's see. There you go. No kidding. Works, detected, works. Okay. How are they defining? And if you scroll all the way. I'm just curious how and, they define yeah. these two, but it's like working a current a module loaded, it's got you know traffic, it's got exactly. Yeah. Okay. It's, and you can click on any of these. <laughs> yep. Uh, that you have that, I mean any of these um so logs or uh, uh So oh, you can you can you can oh well uh, you can click on the C CTL or the oh it just grabs I mean, a snapshot yeah. of that cool uh, and you can run that uh, uh, on every one of your machines and you can use your own I mean you can use the the, the data that's there like right? it's yeah. it's not uh, can you private host this for say a a private cloud company just to do their own inventory and then very selectively yes. share from there. I mean, sorry, I, I don't know if you can private uh, host it. I would imagine you can, but definitely what you can is uh, they, they offer the possibility to track your own, um, your own devices mm -hmm. in a private way. Okay. Uh, and that yes. goes with the Linux, uh, is the companion data, is the data sterilized at collection time or display time uh collection time i understand that's I part so. of the but you can actually look at the, at the at the package uh which is in sysutils uh so it's hw probe hardware probe uh, and i think it's pretty uh it's pretty easy to to audit Okay, fresh board. Very cool. I I had not seen that one. I've seen you know what, whatever that BSD stats was. BSD stats. Let's see if that's still a thing. Uh no, not Saints. Um, BSD stats. Yeah, I'll I'll throw some links in there. There is. That one, thank you. There's also BSD stats, monthly script for reporting anonymous. Duh, duh, duh. Let's see. That one. And I'll also throw in the nice bug, the message database, which is anonymized and does share some of that. I even found that useful for finding uh, they had to prepare the data, but for finding uh, disk serial number formats, because wow, there's that moment that our friends at Snorkel, Sun Oracle, at the post Sun Sun days, when they put a tab in a serial number, and wow, that messed stuff up. Just saying. Anyway, great topics, great, great thing. So I've got a, a hardware probe link for you. Anyway, uh, great work, Alexander. Thank you for that. 
um, keep up the good work. Let us know how we can all help. I will send, make these prettier. Um, anything else here and now? Beehive works great. For my how are you system. using it? What's so I use it. I use it when I want to see if this thing is going to run on Linux. Um, if it's like how's the how does it work on Linux? How are they doing it on Linux? Then I can just pop open. I have a Debian, and I use it with the VNC uh, client. That's that's with it. And sometimes I use it on console. Um, and I'm hoping to get Windows up eventually, but it's just such a low priority right now. It's just like a cool, nice to have. That is awesome. Um, I deploy Windows with a tool I call Imagine, which lets you do it a, a, an auto unattend XML config file. And I can just, I have a two-step process. It, re-rips the image like we did back before VNC. It creates the initial boot, and then you do a final boot to have it actually configure itself. And even for updating the firmware on a camera in Dublin, that worked. And it was, Beehive was the answer for a quick and dirty path to doing that. So yeah, I, I will concur. Beehive is kind of cool. Um, uh, Jan, BSD hardware info, is that your machine? What you got? Copy link. That's oh. just my lab machine, which I just added as a oh, test cool. case. And Sweet. <laughs> yeah, uh, just as an example of what you can, how a report looks. Oh, your root password's in there. Rimshot, but I'm fine. Okay. Ah. Damn, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I have to change the combination on my um, exactly. suitcase as well. Sorry, long week. Okay. Yes, exactly. Um, thank you for bringing up a beehive topic. That is awesome. Uh, other documentation thoughts while we're at it. Um, I will probably say, can I put your machine in the doc here? Jan's uh, lab machine. It's public information now. Yeah, it is now. <laughs> if you want. And you can. It's... Cool. Love it. Ship it. Okay. And that was uh, PC. And one thing that is not uh, always super clear, you can yep. create, um, you can create uh, an, a, an identif a unique identifier for your machine that you can, and which is persistent. Uh, so you can track your, uh, the, the evolution of your machine between, uh, you know, the different versions of FreeBSD. So what was working, what is now working, was not working. Interesting. Uh, pretty... Cool. I like that. Uh, even just the potential for regression hunting or, oops, this now works, this stopped working. This is, mm -hmm. that is very cool. And I can see how I'm sure with not a whole lot of work, such a tool could be very useful to a, a, a private cloud provider, a, a data center of some form. I mean, everyone's tracking that information in various ways already. Uh, and we've all written our homegrown little scripts to collect such information. Oh goodness, I think I, I think I published one. And John, you had some great advice on how to track HBAs and stuff, simple things like that. Um, Let's see. I yep. I will throw mine out there. Michael, that's true. what was my name again? Well, Michael, uh, something you said earlier reminded me. Please. Um, I haven't worked on it for a little while, but I found the I do a lot of Beehive with pass through PPT. Yep. And the the Beehive uh, PCI PPT code yes does not support allocating the MSI X vectors and being passed back a value smaller than what was passed in and then reallocating with the smaller value. 
So if you want it to work, you have to make use of all of them. I don't want to make use of all of them. I want to make use of an allocated number. You I know what I meant is your guest has to take them all, or what is the issue? I'm sorry? Uh, in which situation does that happen? Yeah, can you describe that those steps so I can type them in? What's the exact uh, What we will produce to there? show that this is a, a real-world problem. What would your PR I, look I don't like? doubt that it is, but yeah, what, so... what are the steps? So let's assume I have a system with a lot of NVMe installed. Fine. Okay, let him... And I do not want, I want to allocate a certain number of MSIX vectors. I have gone into the, uh, the, the, the PPT code the setup code, and I have set it to do a, a min of star count and another value. And this works for the majority of drivers. However, when Beehive comes up and calls in, it does not understand how to retry with a value different than the one that it passed in. For count. So does real hardware do that, but Beehive does not? That is correct. Ah, okay. That's making more sense. Uh, uh, hold on to the, let me try to phrase this correctly. Hold on to the. And the, the card, it's the device itself changes that value. Like, in op normal, normal operation or something? So a physical device usually comes in and says, I, I can handle N number of MSIX vectors, like 136, for okay. instance. And there's absolutely no reason for it to have 136. So we want to dump it down to maybe 64 or 32 or, or some value. Uh, you said 136 was your example from a real device? Yes. Okay. Oh, this so it reports it and then Beehive just says, oh, that's that's great. I will go with that. And then you, what do you, do you exhaust them if every device only gives its maximum? That, that is correct. Okay. This is making more sense. Thank you for for spelling this out. And I, I see where you're headed with this. Uh, the number of MSIX and especially non-X MSI interrupts is limited in PCI. And if you take the worst case for every device, you uh, run out of them quickly on modern hardware. Mm -hmm. It's not a big issue on a laptop. It's not an issue on most desktops, but on a server you are actually using, especially one with NVMe drives, uh, as in a front hot plug of real NVMe drives routed to the PCI buses, it's guaranteed that you will exhaust them if you do what. Do we know that number? Like 1024? What's, what is, what do, yes. Define exhausted. Yes, 1024 is a good example. That's okay. one possible value. I thought Hans, so are you following 256 along? on older systems. I'm sorry, who is that question to, Michael? Hans. That is to Hans, a freelance uh, developer looking for small projects and related to Beehive. <laughs> so, uh, Hans, if you haven't checked out, uh, I'm curious if you're following along the, the yeah. problem described here, because I suspect the Lumos might have the same problem. And uh, scalability issues are a repeat theme in all the calls. And this sounds like a scaling issue where, like you said, uh, Jan, there's just fine on your laptop, no worries. But when you uh, create a larger system, you you hit these yep. limits that the, the original developer may have never hit, had the opportunity to hit. Go ahead, Jan. Hans. Hans. I'm pretty sure that Illumis doesn't have that problem. Uh, first of all, the PPT code is uh, pretty much very different. 
Oh, and um, the system itself limits the amount of vectors that um, the device can, the PPT driver in that instance, uh, can can access and uh, give over to Beehive. So that uh, I don't think that problem exists there. Um, well, when it comes to FreeBSD Beehive and a FreeBSD PPT code, that's yeah, some some sort of limiting is probably would be sensible to add there. And if I'm not mistaken, it, it on real hardware, it's a quick negotiation where the device says, hey, I actually need this many, it's either at what runtime or... I, I think it's more like uh, the device what? tells you how much it supports, and then you configure a certain number of that. Um, and if you use less than what the device supports, that's okay. And depending on what kind of device it is, it may hurt the performance, but... Um, that's entirely up to you. Does the kernel handle that that kind of ra rationing of the interrupts or what? I, yeah, I'm, the, I'm not a hardware, that. low level hardware guy. Yeah. Go ahead. Custom wide limit on eight MSIX vectors per device, uh, except when you use some fancy um, interrupt vector API that allows basically negotiation between the driver and the system if there's pressure and on vectors, you can give up some and later get them back. Um, there's an API for that in Illumos, but um, I think only one driver actually uses it. So everyone else is stuck at eight vectors. But so hmm. far, that has been much of an issue, even even with high performance network cards like 40 gig stuff. I'm not aware of that being an issue. Well. If you have enough cores, it will become an issue on 100 gig or so, because you can have, I think, at most one ring per interrupt, right? Yeah, that's pretty much the idea right that. So maybe the 40 gig drivers do something um, to get around this and use this fancy API. At, at the time when I actually looked at this, when I wrote the NVMe driver for Illumos, I think one of the 10 gig drivers was using it. I'm not. I'm not sure. It's it's been a couple of years. Anyway, uh, most normal hardware like NVMe devices uh, are limited to eight vectors, as far as I know. But that is a limitation of the kernel, not of the hardware, right? Because I've seen That's devices limited. that claim to have far more possible queues. Yeah, of course, you can. If you lose um, the capabilities, it's just it that is, you're not using it. There is, of course, also a way to override it if you don't have that many devices that the limit is actually necessary. But for some reason, someone at some time thought it is useful to not overuse MSIX vectors. Because they're limited hardware resource. Yeah, so that's, that's, there's a limit there how much an individual device can claim. And usually when you... In a, in a driver, you check how much vectors you can get, and then you get that much or get less if you if you need less. And mm -hmm. for and we we assigned we we, we get uh, never more vectors than we have CPUs. And yep. uh, if we have more CPUs than than vectors, then we do a mapping to the individual because vectors, and that's. I well. think I saw devices uh, NVMe SSDs using more than. Uh, eight vectors on a 16 core machine uh, with a, with like two SSDs that it just allocated one per of hyper thread and called it a day because there was enough hardware resources on FreeBSD at least. Well, you can but definitely it may have changed. The hardware still works, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> uh John, as the one reporting, how does the user turn those knobs? Sys controls? Um, what's it look like to a user? Right now, I'm yeah. I'm making modifications to the source. Oh, that's that. Most users can do that. Just I put that the, in the manual page. How to do that? <laughs> I am the I am the user. Um, I know that's cool, I am but still, this is where I'm generating large server systems as VMs. Um, Uh, remarkably, I only found one mention of MSIX in bugs.freebsd.org, but it's like, well, here is a, an AMD 64. How did you write it? Uh, I tried with and without a hyphen between them. MSI 
X for what it's worth. So um, I have I have seen this in the wild and it definitely took some tracking down. So um, this must be on the radar of, you know, Kib and Mark Johnston and John and the people kind of architecting FreeBSD, but uh, does it just not impact enough users that this hasn't been comprehensively addressed or it's purely within the Beehive context that Beehive is not behaving well enough like real hardware that that's where you're being burned or what's the scope of this problem? It's it's Beehive. It's Beehive, okay. Um, um, I do you have a PR or do you have enough now enough ways of vocalizing it to create a PR? I don't have a working fix yet, so I don't have any kind of a PR. Well, first understanding the problem is is much of the issue at hand. So yeah, a lot of the people they understand the problem in like 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 you mentioned like Kib and like those guys are never going to put it in the in the bug report and uh, like I did with ZFS the other day. Yep. Uh, I think uh, John commented on that. That's an issue, and I don't really understand that issue. I'm like a normal user who's just interested in writing documentation for some god awful reason, and like, so I don't really understand fully that issue. But it seems like the kind of thing that's very difficult and expensive to reproduce reliably. So I'm like trying to figure out okay we've got this bug report on open zfs we've got this bug report on freebsd bug tracker uh there's got to be some way that we can document this that there is a potential foot gun you know in a specific way that is not creating fear uncertainty and doubt and uh but but still you know making it more reliable by increasing user awareness of a potential the other big problem is that by the point you can identify that you've run out of MSIX interrupts and put it in a bug report, you're ninety percent of a workaround at least, if not solution. Uh, so I assume that a lot of the bug reports will not specify that they are MSIX related. It will say something like only the first four or eight or whatever NVMe drives show up. which is a lot harder to identify quickly in the millions of open bug reports, which are okay, not millions, but. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, it's about, it, it, is, it is just over 10,000 right now. So that's, you know, and there's not a lot of people working on this either. So it's. Um, well, that's yeah. actually a pretty low number when you have a device that wants 137 and you have more than 10 of them. Oh, sorry. I meant uh, bugs. just over 10,000 bugs. Yeah. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I thought you meant, to... okay, never mind. Yeah, no. So, John, do you have an but, example but, of exactly but... where you fix this? You hard to fix it in the code? Just a diff of like, here's what I'm provided and here's the manual if value. When I have a work, if and it? when I have a working fix, happy to. Oh, I mean, it sounds like you have a fix, which is simply bumping a value in the source code. Could you share that line just so it's so no, it's in terms of developers? That doesn't that doesn't work for Ooh. me. That's ah. where I'm, that's where I'm headed. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um. Uh, Hans, there is an opportunity here. Uh, budget's a different issue. I don't know if. Uh, John's company is ever into that kind of thing of like, hey, supporting someone to repair it. But here we have supply and demand. I'll let the uh, market work its way out, itself out, et cetera. So okay. John, keep us informed, drop a line to Hans. It sounds like it's a very much an issue if Beehive is not behaving like real hardware. Um, thank you. <laughs> Matthias, what you got? QBQ, does anybody have that? Um, quick beat my question. Yeah, yes. I'm afraid I got to step out, guys. Take I care. Will talk to you Good all luck. later. Andrew, hang in there. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Bye. Go ahead, Matthias, and I'll make it a small, lowercase b. I didn't write that rule. Uh, I'm, I have no opinion on it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm, I've been trying to use the. Uh, 
um, with B VMB Hive uh, a directive uh, to um, when you try to when you configure a, a guest uh, where you can uh, instead of having VMB Hive uh, create a tap device uh, automatically and uh, assign it, uh, you can ask it to reuse an existing uh, device. I mean, that's what the manual says, uh, but I haven't been able to, uh, to, to, to make it work. Uh, I did uh, format the, I mean, modify the, the app device I was creating uh, so that it seemed to me that it was absolutely identical uh, in, in properties to the, to that that was created by uh, by VMB Hive, but the result is still that uh, when I try to to when I specify this and I try to start uh, uh, VM uh, with this, it, it just breaks with a status four. Uh, so just a question: if anyone had used this successfully or had a, some idea of uh, something I was doing wrong uh, in what I was doing. Okay. Any uh, users there? I mean, go ahead. I have a uh, dropped the link to a script I wrote. Mm. Ah. It's a helper script. That's not directly what you're asking for, probably, but it is, uh, in my opinion, same interface for uh, for all cloners except for ePair because ePair is a special uh, corner case because it is a cloner which creates two interfaces uh, in pairs. Uh, but the normal cloners create just one interface and this is for them. So basically this, uh, you can build up your command line. So you specify the cloner and then the interfaces. If I remember correctly, it's written in such a way that you can uh, use the flex multiple times because it basically applies the effects as it uh, encounters the arguments. Um, and here, so that you can send something, use something like a dash B to set the bridge and then run multiple dash M arguments or something. And it is idempotent, which uh, means that if the effect is already as intended, it uh, just reports that that interface already existed. And um, it also um, takes care of the nasty corner cases because you can have things like if you, for example, use this command line, I'm about to type it to the chat. I have config uh, create ton, or let's use top in this case, name uh, VM zero. This command can fail, but still create an interface because uh, interface creation and interface renaming is not one atomic step but two steps, the first one, whether done via Netlink or the traditional IOCTL interface is yeah. to create the interface and only then can you assign an arbitrary name to it. But even if you check beforehand, there's a time of check versus time of use conflict where someone else could have done the same check because there is no locking protocol, uh, which is universally accepted for this. So that even if you check is VM zero, uh, uh, available interface name, okay, nobody is using it, create an, the next free top interface and name it VM0, uh, this can still fail because um, there's a race condition there. Um, okay. Yeah. Potentially cool. the access control framework could also, a uh, mandatory access control framework could also block this, but realistically speaking, race conditions between different startup scripts are more likely, I think. Um, yeah, and then you have, end up with, okay, the IF config command failed, but it still produced output and created an interface and you don't want to leak interfaces and stuff like this. So it's a bit annoying to automate. I think that script is about 400 lines, yeah. It's huge. So, um, hmm? I said it's huge. It's a beast. No. Anyway. Uh, most of this is, is error handling and logging code, but or just very verbose uh, code formatting. 
But yeah. The other problem to watch uh, out for is that if, uh, if you use tap interfaces directly and not through a bridge, uh, and you put an uh, address with a prefix on the uh, tap interface at the ho on the host, so let's say you allocate a slash 30 to a beehive guest via IPv4, traditionally, so that it doesn't matter if the operating system you're starting has uh, slash 31 support and DHCP and so on all works as normally and nothing feels unusual and you get micro um, segmentation. But if you do that, you have a network route to your uh, virtual machine. And the moment we have closed the tab interface, it goes linked down and the network route over the down interface is removed. You keep the address and if you bring the interface back up, the um, address so the host route for your local address comes back but the network route is gone for good because it was truly deleted and not marked as uh, down uh, because its next hop was uh, known to be down so the route got deleted and yeah that's a problem so the workaround is to use vmnet as interface name so that it is by default configured not to go down when closed, and thereby you basically have a black hole interface. Um, if you really want to keep the tab interface in place, that works. So that you only have to set it up once, set the static route once. The other option is to just destroy the tab interface and recreate it, which is also valid. But so especially if you're using direct tab interface numbers, you probably don't want to destroy it because someone could just block your name while you're running. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Food for thought. If yeah. I, I, that, that has given me a couple of uh, ideas, and I will try to, to in any case, your uh, your script that seems very helpful. Yeah, in look at the script. Uh, uh, it automates a bunch of stuff, um, and yeah. Uh, if you think there's a limitation in VM Beehive, please communicate it on that doc, if you will kindly, because uh, it sounds like various folks around here are the inadvertent maintainers, whether they like it or not. So uh, here's that doc. And Hans, please go through that Why doc. do you want, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. What is your use case? Matthias, why do you want uh, VM Beehive to <clears throat> not create your interfaces for you? Um, because uh, well, it's if if I if I uh, uh, first if I name them, uh, it's much clearer when I look at my I do an if config uh, and I see which uh, tab is for which uh, VM. Uh, and since I'm using now Wi-Fi box, uh, I need to uh, I need to actually add those tabs, those tab interfaces to Wi-Fi box uh, when I want that uh, VM to to be communicating with the with the outside. So uh, if I if I have named the, if I have a named uh, tab device uh, named after the the, uh, the VM. It uh, it makes it easy to script because I can just uh, test whether that uh, tap device exists uh, and uh, if it has the right uh, properties and add it to the to the Wi-Fi box interface and that's mm, I think there's a better way to accomplish that mm -hmm. already built into FreeBSD and that's the auto bridge uh, mechanism through the bridge rc.d script. Uh, if you look into the rc.conf main page, I hope it's documented there. And uh, let me check. Yep, it's documented. Auto bridge interfaces. Um, Link. You have the. Is that at the command line it's, or uh, RC, command uh, seven, rc.conf uh, main page? Okay, thank it's you. In section five. Okay. Um, basically, it is a way to specify that. Certain interfaces should be, uh, be members on a certain bridge, even if they're dynamically created. Uh, it works with FD and yeah. 
it's available by default unless you and works unless you disable DFT. There it is. So start the other interface and that thing should be added. Okay. That uh, I can see where that would Check be. Check the RC.t script for the implementation detail and potential limitations, but it does work for normal interface. I don't know if the member interfaces must be started to be usable, but that shouldn't be a problem if you just auto start them. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that is definitely uh, useful. It's it doesn't completely solve my use case, but anyway, it, it's given me enough to to, to definitely uh, 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 do another iteration. Thanks a lot. I will look at this uh, auto bridge. So in auto bridge interfaces, you list the names of the bridges you want to dynamically add members to, and then you use auto bridge underscore interface name. Uh, for just shared block patterns of um, interface names you want to add to that bridge. Nice, 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 nice. Very good. As seen in cool. the example yeah, actually, for Bridge Yeah, yeah. This here, for example, would mean fine. that any, anything starting with tap uh, is added a DC0, which kind of dates how old the feature is. Is the DC oh, driver still around, oh. or was it? Oh, Alexander, doc question. Oh, it did. Yeah, you're still here. That's no, cool. it's, uh, yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah. the. Uh, is that still here? Yeah. Well, let's see. It's uh, it is. Um, but you have to search for it in the right category or not uh, the commands because the DC calculator comes first, being in section one. That's but a it's a uh, 100 megabit. Uh -huh. uh, Let's say a bronze age, not stone age. Uh, Nick. Ah, nice, but yes, okay. It's not an any two thousand, but it's not far removed. Jeez, yes, okay, I love it. Let me try to find that. That's funny. Yep, the sure. deck Intel deck. Where are they now? Twenty one one four three, and it's clones. That's funny. Yeah, okay, that. That example Driver might... dates back to FreeBSD 4.0. Can we do like an EM0 example rather than that? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I love it. Well, and Ooh. that's what it looks like. That's, you know, well, how do we keep, you know, gee, FreeBSD has been along, around long enough that there is documentation that is older than the hills. How do we keep on top of that? And the auto bridge might not change, but the example may sure change. Love it. Okay. Anyway, uh, other topics. I'm glad we discussed Beehive a few times there. This is not the prettiest uh, URL, but here it is. Um, go ahead. Maybe not not a topic per se, but just uh, related to the conversation we had before. What There's the, that. Uh, <laughs> which which of the n numerous about uh, um, making it easier for people to to submit bugs? Uh, there's that project bug reports. I hope not bugs. Yeah, people are really Sorry. good at. <laughs> <laughs> we don't submit more bugs. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> snark, snark. Yeah, yeah right. It's quite a commitment. Uh, I'm better at creating bugs then. Right. Anyway, so what is uh, th there is that the library called uh, uh, Termbin. I mean, library, no, uh, a website called Termbin, where you can you can um, NC NC uh, NC catch to the output of any comment to it, and it will return the it will publish it uh, on the website and uh, return you the the the, the URL. But you can self-host it, and it's uh, so it's something that could be used for people to be able to uh, very easily uh, submit, you know, their logs and their. Uh, um, so you can, oh, I yeah, I feel. Yes, but these kind of services have a limited um, 
shelf life or the links created by them have. Um, so unless you have a FreeBSD project runs a blessed instance, we have to assume that if you want to find a 14 year old bug report like Alexander just described, uh, the link is broken. So you want things in band in the package manager for yeah. posterity. Not wrong, sure. but it's a good sure. idea. Nice. It is a good idea for large things, but <clears throat> it's also a good idea to just uh, attach files to your uh, PR. Well, they they have 20, 24 million active, uh, I think, active. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, uh, yeah, and if you self host, you can actually decide how long you keep it. But uh, and you can you could probably I mean you could archive it also right in a way that uh, uh, that is not so resource consuming. But anyway, mm -hmm. we definitely it's... prefer. Sorry, we definitely prefer a Git format patch attached to the bug report uploaded to the bug tracker. Yep, yeah. I'm sure. I get that these services are useful and this one is very easy to use, a bit too easy in my opinion because it's it gives you a way to host things under a domain without authentication for the writer. Mm, these kinds of services are normally blacklisted uh, eventually if they become <laughs> well known. Um, and with reason because we will get yeah. them to death. If you can do anything interesting with them. Um, yeah. It's so true. Yeah, if the comment strikes again. But yeah, for bug reporting, I think something like a proper send bug command, which could you give a bug number and then you can attach something from standard in under a name. That would be nice. <laughs> but it's easy to propose well, I, work for someone else. Well, you know exactly. Yeah. But the, the, uh, actually, what I what I had in mind when I was Putting that is not so much to use it as a way for you to to you know uh, I, um, publish it so that you can share the the URL, but more um, to uh, capture get the data. that output, yeah, yeah, capture that's... the data and have it and have it attached to the because that is definitely not linked to the hosting part. I mean, you have the code for the hosting, but the hosting is only. Uh, some, uh, on uh, another layer on top of it, that what it does basically is give you that um, that uh, um, way to to persist uh, this information that is that can be difficult for non technical people to 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 capture. Okay. Yeah, just getting things out of the system. If you <coughs> don't have something like PB copy, PB paste on a Mac or something on your workstation, that's totally a valid use case of that. I just wanted to say that it's important to press, to um, record your attachments for posterity in the bug tracker and not just <laughs> make them available for the next few days or weeks. Right. Well, here's a fun one. So the system can perform a crash dump. It would sure be nice if that crash dump could grab hold of information you have pre-saved or could generate magically during the dumping process and get a lot of that peripheral information. Like, oh, your piece Forget of the last part. Hey, You're not I can dream, buddy. During the crash <clears throat> process. Either you're doing it ahead of time and just attaching That's it. That's what right. I said. Okay. Well, when your system is crashed, there's no time to start scanning. Correct. Uh, all but the hardware. we want this to magically happen. So, what can we pre collect and attach to a crash dump in some way or, or save other places and just look it up only if we crash, et cetera, if you see where I'm headed with this? <clears throat> yeah. Either have a well known location in the file system where an RC script on startup makes sure this exists uh, and is in the version of the command so that 
then you check, okay, it's this with this and so and so of the crash report information. Yeah, it is. But just on otherwise generate that information uh, in a detached daemon process because that can take a while if you look at something like HW probe. And then you can uh, potentially include this somewhere in a crash report or more likely in the crash report extraction command to combine those. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't even have to be in the crash report unless you're dumping over the network. But if you're dumping locally, yeah. Anyway, just have... we've covered a lot of good ground. We're at a moose jaw, which is the time it takes to fly from uh, Portland to Ottawa and cross over the town of Moose Jaw. An hour and a half. Anything else at this time? I do I have a hackathon share. item, but it'll be on uh, after the recording. Go ahead. Who is that? It's Alex. Can I just share a really silly success? Absolutely, man. I talked to Colin, uh, our previously release engineer, yep. and we uh, we did some work improving the um, search results in Apropos and also on the hardware release notes of the Amazon Web Services Elastic Network driver. And he said that we can put both sponsored by Google and sponsored by Amazon on the commit. Oh, nice. Okay. Very cool. Uh, I think link that to is drop majorly it in, but funny. Off you go. Huh? Hey, uh oh, Jan, you have some snark in the chat. Good, good work. Totally um, off topic. Totally off topic. Okay, well then. Uh, and also, Alexander, if those aforementioned companies are itching to uh, support efforts like all of these, do let me know. I did happen to talk to someone with AWS just earlier this week, Monday, in fact. Uh, who did some great presentations at the Open ZFS User and Developer Summit. And I hope to have those videos up later today, if I'm lucky. Only some of them are having technical issues. I'm down to like two that are having challenges. So watch for those. And thank you, everyone. I say we call it here. And if you want to stick around and hack, great. I need to get a USB A to C adapter to run the test I want to run. So, which is Beehive on the ThinkPad X. 13S Snapdragon, not to be confused with the ThinkPad X13S with the exact same name. So um, uh, go ahead. As far as staying and in, in hacking, uh, John, are you still here? Um, asking about the uh, Arc Max, uh, VFS.ZFS.Arc Max. That's apparently said it's well documented, but I'm not seeing it in the manual. Uh, and I have some more questions about that because I would like to fix it at this time. I posted a little comment that I made, which uh, Michael added to his uh, log here. Yeah, he's been dropping things in chat, which are very helpful, and he's pretty much extracted the meat of it, if you will. Um, but yeah, let's stick around. So if I were to ask the question, who wants the honors? Will someone know what I mean by that? Like and subscribe. Thank you, Jan. Have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.